All this gives rise to what we call this liberal Republican movement, which starts out as a critique of Grantism, as they call it. This political corruption, this domination of the party by machines. Many of these early leaders are people who've been pushed out of politics, of political uh, leadership by these um, uh, new political bosses in the Republican Party. But increasingly, they begin to link the corruption of the Grant administration and what they begin to say is the failure of Reconstruction. They begin to echo white Southern complaints against Reconstruction. In fact, they begin to link what's going on in the North and the South. In both places, the wrong people are in power. The wrong people are in power. In the North, it's, pol it's these political corrupt city machines like the Tweed Ring, stalwart Republicans, in the South, it's blacks, carpetbaggers, the more intelligent, the natural rulers of society have been pushed out of power, both North and South. People will not longer accept devotion to human equality or the rights of man, says the nation, as an excuse for the condition of the finances and civil service. In other words, they're spending too much money, the wrong people are in power in the civil service. The South, and, and increasingly, this becomes overtly racist as well. The nation, again, the South is under the control of men who have inherited the weaknesses of barbarism. Barbarism, that old pro-slavery word, now coming back into power, into uh, vogue and use to describe African-American voters uh, in the South. Or Francis Parkman, one of the great founders of American historical scholarship. Parkman, the greatest historian of the middle of the 19th century, writes, two enemies unknown before have risen like spirits of darkness on our social and political horizon, an ignorant proletariat and a half-taught plutocracy. The plutocracy, the very rich, the ignorant proletariat, the very poor. Okay, this is Parkman speaking for the middle. You see the middle class, the intelligent, educated middle class pushed out. All right, but which is worse? It's the, half, it's the ignorant proletariat, and who are they? Large portions of populous cities are filled by masses of imported ignorance. Imported ignorance, see the immigrants, right? They're the ones who are voting for the Tweed Ring. And hereditary ineptitude. Hereditary. It's built in. There's nothing they can do about it. Hereditary ineptitude. The ballot, that, 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 that's the blacks. You see, the, the, um, the imported ignorance is the immigrants. Hereditary ineptitude is the way they describe the former slaves. Then the ballot only educates to mischief. In other words, giving the right to vote to those kind of people produces bad results. What is the evidence? Witness the municipal corruption of New York and the monstrosities of Negro rule in South Carolina. Tweed Ring, South Carolina. Municipal corruption, Negro rule. Both become linked together as examples of bad government. Bad government because the wrong people are voting and holding office. So what began as a critique of political corruption in the North becomes a call for a new Southern policy um, by Republicans, by people who had actually been, many of them, radicals a few years before. This is a significant retreat from the radical vision of a society of equals. It is not just racists and Northern Democrats, or more to the point, they are now absorbing the racist critique of Reconstruction that had been there from the very beginning among the Democratic opposition. And for their part, the Democratic Party, after losing in 1868, the Democratic Party in the North has embarked on what they call the new departure. They say, no, we are not trying to take away the rights of blacks anymore. We, okay, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, they are in the Constitution, that is settled. We're looking for good government. It is no longer race, we're looking for good government. The rights of these people are safe, doesn't matter who's gonna be elected, they're in the Constitution. So the whole, the race issue disappears from, at least for the moment, from democratic, national democratic party uh, politics. It becomes good government is the issue. Um, and the issues of the war are settled. There's no need to debate them anymore. Let's look to the future. And 
So in 1872, this strange political coalition is created between these liberal Republicans, a significant part of the Republican Party, and Northern and the Democratic Party. And of course, who do they, they, they meet in convention in Cincinnati, the liberal Republicans, and they nominate Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, to be their presidential candidate. This was a very strange choice, to say the least. First of all, Greeley was completely mercurial. He had advocated every possible political position. You know, at the beginning of the Civil War, let them go in peace. Then, no, no, don't let them go. On to Richmond. we got to invade Richmond. No, no, let's have peace again. On. During the Civil War, no, emancipation. No, not emancipation. He just kept switching back and forth to, from one position to another, completely unpredictably. Um, so he had no real plan. But he was a very revered editor in the North. The New York Tribune was the most important Republican newspaper in the North. Greeley was revered by many, many voters all around the North. He was, not, he was thought to be a formidable candidate. But, the, but making Greeley uh, the candidate of a coalition with Democrats was a little tricky. First of all, he had spent his entire political life denouncing Democrats. He started out as a Whig, then he became a Republican, and he held opposite positions on everything. Most of these reformers were for a low tariff. I said before, 19th century liberalism. When they call themselves liberal Republican, they are talking about liberalism in the 19th century. Free trade, limited government, ruled by the educated men. Not liberalism as it has been in the 20th century coming out of the New Deal with governmental welfare or whatever you want to call it, social security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, this is the laissez-faire liberalism, the liberalism of limited government and free trade. Greeley was an advocate of the high protective tariff. He didn't believe in free trade. Greeley was an advocate of a strong federal government. The only issue on which these groups could agree was ending Reconstruction. That was the one thing the liberal Republicans and the Democrats shared in common. As I said, Greeley was a strange candidate. He had to, he had to constantly be explaining previous statements in his career. So at one point he issued a statement, I never said that all drunk, no, I never said that all Democrats are drunkards. I only said that all drunkards are Democrats. <laughs> This did not go down well with the Democratic vote. Um, abolitionists were very torn here because many of them revered Greeley, the remaining radicals, but most of them stuck with Grant because Grant had crushed the Ku Klux Klan and it, the only hope for protecting the rights of African Americans in the South, they felt, was to continue with Grant's presidency. And moreover, the Republicans nominated for vice president to go along with Grant, Henry Wilson, a radical Republican ex-senator from Massachusetts. This is the answer to one of our oral exams questions for graduate students here. Which president had both his vice presidents die in office? I'm sure you, that's Grant, right? Silo Koufax, Wilson. That's what happens on orals, folks. Um, or even better with Grant is which president received no electoral votes. Which presidential candidate received no electoral votes? After George Washington, who was elected unanimously, so no one else got anything. Um, Greeley only carried six states. Uh, the border states of Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, and then and Tennessee, Georgia. Grant carried the whole North and many Southern states. Greeley proved to be a terrible candidate. Um, he was, so how did he get no electoral votes? Six states means, I think it was 66 electoral votes, or whatever it was. Um, well, the problem was Greeley died soon after the election was held. So when the Electoral College met, they couldn't vote for Greeley. So the electors in his states scattered their votes among other candidates. So Greeley didn't get any votes, so there you go. All right, Greeley got no electoral votes.